Well, welcome everybody to tonight's webinar, Designing Your Rain Garden. I'm really glad you're here with us this evening. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking about gardening and plants as uh, I hope it brings some joy and peace to you all as it does for me as we uh, ride out the end of this pandemic together. Okay. Uh, so my name is Becca Robinson. I'm a landscape designer for green infrastructure projects at Reap Green Solutions. Uh, Reap Green Solutions is an environmental charity operating in Waterloo Region in Ontario, Canada, for those of you joining us from afar. And we've been working in the region for over 20 years to help you live more sustainably. We have a variety of events this spring. We've had several webinars already, which have been uh, really well attended. So we're thrilled to see that. And we have three more left uh, so far this season. May 19th, Ready, Set, Grow, uh, which is tomorrow, uh, where you can take a look at how gardening can help with big issues like food security, biodiversity, and climate change. Uh, June 9th, we have options for permeable driveways, patios, and paths, which is pretty self-explanatory. And July 21st and 28th, we have a two-part series for um, a deep dive into planting and caring for trees in your yard. So please consider joining us for one of those as well. So we have a lot to discuss tonight. Um, my hope is that you leave here today with a really good understanding of what a rain garden is, uh, what they can do, and if it's suitable for you in your specific setting. Um, and that you also know the key considerations for designing one for yourself. So a rain garden is a shallow sunken garden uh, built to capture and absorb stormwater runoff. As seen as in this example, uh, stormwater runoff is coming from this home's downspout on the top right side. Um, it's directed into a shallow garden area in the center of the picture um, where it slows down and soaks into a very sandy soil. Any excess rainwater that can't be absorbed into this garden uh, during a very heavy rainfall, for example, can flow out of the rain garden through the bottom of the image where there's some river rock. So in this picture, you can see very clearly some of the main components of a rain garden, the inlet, the basin, plants, and the outlet. When you look at the cross section of a rain garden, you can see the other critical components of a rain garden, which is a really thick layer of sandy well-draining soil that's sculpted at the top to be a shallow dish where rain can pool temporarily during a rain event and then eventually seep into the ground below. You can also see plants here uh, and plants play, play a really critical role both above and below the ground to help a rain garden function. They're not vital to a rain garden being a rain garden in that we need water to enter it, soak into the ground and exit if it's over, uh, over full. But plants really enhance the functioning of a rain garden. They pull out um, bits of contaminants that may be in your rainwater when it's uh, flowing into it from the downspout. They slow the water down enough to actually stop and sink in. Um, and then below ground, the roots help suck the water in, they help with evapotranspiration, and they help filter the water even further so that it's as clean as possible when it enters the water table. A rain garden that is sized correctly and it's functioning properly will fill up with water during a rain event and drain completely within 24 hours after the rain event. So that's really critical. These are features that are designed to hold water and for a very short period of time and then drain completely and be dry between rain events. So for me, my rain garden in my um, yard that I've shown here would be a pond basically for a couple of hours right after a rain, but then would be completely dry, like no visible water. I'm sure the soil was moist uh, just within a couple of hours. So really amazing um, how quickly that much water can soak into the ground when you have the right kind of soil. So a quick kind of zoom out to why we're talking about this and why this is important. Uh, conventional stormwater management systems typically take water from a st uh, stormwater catch basin and hard pipes and deliver the runoff directly to a pond or a waterway as seen at the top. So this type of treatment is inel inelastic and impervious and provides no way for the runoff to slow down or soak into the ground or be filtered at all prior to entering our local waterways. So it enters those waterways at high speed and dirty, basically. And the image at the bottom, um, in contrast, uh, uses soil, topography, and plants to reduce the amount of runoff entering the local waterways. And the water that does end up there is a lot cleaner and moving slower. 
So the reducing the amount of water that reaches our waterways in the stormwater system is critically important. Climate change modeling for our area and Waterloo region um, suggests that rain event frequency and intensity is increasing and that the total precipitation annually could increase by up to 12% by 2050. So there's been some studies done of the city's stormwater system um, currently or within the past several years that show that it's already in some areas um, at capacity or exceeding capacity. So the amount of stormwater entering a catch basin um, in the stormwater system, it sometimes surpasses the volume of the system and its ability to take that water away. So, and this is going to be further challenged in the future based on the climate change projections I just mentioned. There's general acknowledgement from municipalities and professionals that green infrastructure, rain gardens and the similar features, which are landscapes that use natural vegetation to manage water will be critically important to adapting to climate change and to bolster the stormwater system that the municipality maintains. And private property like ours are seen as critical sources of absorptive unpaved landscapes that could be used to infiltrate more stormwater and reduce the flood risk for the whole community. So I find that really promising. So many of the big problems we face as a society, you feel like a small little peon, you can't do much, but we are land managers of little sponges that we live on and we can manage that land to provide a huge community service, which is to soak up the rain that falls on it and not allow that runoff to enter the already maxed out uh, stormwater system that we rely on. So as such, the city of Kitchener really values the role of private property owners and residents uh, that they can play in the managing community stormwater and reducing flood risk. So the city of Kitchener incentivizes property owners to slow rain down and soak it up in their yards by providing a stormwater credit of up to 45% off your stormwater utility fee each month. So if you build something like a rain garden or have rain barrels or a permeable driveway, you can get um, money off of your uh, utility bill every month. Um, and tonight we're officially launching a new program with the city of Kitchener who sponsored the webinar tonight, I might add, uh, called Rain Smart Neighborhoods. So beginning tonight, and technically I guess tomorrow during business hours, uh, we are going to begin uh, the Rain Smart Neighborhoods program where we're providing our landscape expertise to any Kitchener resident, um, anyone who wants to make a Rain Smart change in their yard. We'll be supporting residents in completing projects on their property such as rainwater harvesting, rain gardens, infiltration galleries, tree planting, naturalized landscaping, and permeable paving. So check out our website if you live in the city of Kitchener, uh, reapgreen.ca slash rain dash smart. You can navigate there from our main webpage, reapgreen.ca, if that's easier to remember. Um, and read about the program and please submit uh, a form where we can have your contact information and let you know how we can help you along this journey to becoming rain smart. So tonight, we're going to distill the basics of designing a rain garden in eight steps. Um, I recently moved into a new house um, a year ago, basically. Um, and I've been itching to do uh, a front yard makeover myself. So I'm going to use my own yard tonight as an example. And hopefully you can follow along with me for your property or repeat the steps I'm taking tonight um, later to create a rain garden design for your yard. Um, after tonight's work, workshop, my plan is to build the thing that I'll be designing. I've designed it the last couple of days preparing for tonight, but I'll be showing you the design of it tonight and the steps I took. And then my goal is to build it with my family um, over the next couple of weeks as we wrap up the lockdown here. And I'll circulate the after pictures and videos um, in hope, and hopefully it'll all come together and I can share that with you all afterwards. Um, if you never see or hear from me again, you'll know it did not work out very well. <laughs> One of my helpers will be two, so there you go. So step one is assess your space. It's very important to do a thorough assessment of your property and your house to determine if you could build a rain garden at all, and if so, where. So for me, as a landscape architect, I just observe topography and drainage, washout patterns, plant health and downspout locations all the time. Walking around the neighborhood, I look at uh, other people's uh, properties and I definitely think about that for myself all the time. So I recommend that you think about those things. Walk around your house, both in good weather and in rainy weather, 
so you can get a full understanding of what's going on with the rain on your property and how it's draining away. So the most important factors to consider when picking a location for a rain garden, it needs to be approximately three meters or 10 feet away from your building foundation. That is the safe distance away for us to be promoting infiltration of that much water into the ground. We don't recommend you infiltrate water near any nearer than that to your foundation just to protect the um, structure of your house. It needs to be on a relatively flat area. So a slope between one and 5%. You can Google how to determine the slope on your property if you're not sure, but that's basically flat, a little bit of an incline, but nothing major. Um, it needs to be downslope from a source of runoff. So we want water to naturally flow towards it. And we'll talk about some ways you can unnaturally get the water to flow towards it. But generally speaking, you wanna put your rain garden downhill from the end of your downspout or the end of a patio that slopes that direction or something similar like that. You want your rain garden to be upslope or uphill from a naturalized area or a lawn or a woodland or something so you can direct overflow from your rain garden. So we're going to design and size the rain garden tonight, but we always want to be prepared for the event of a flash flood or a really heavy rain that your rain garden just can't soak up fast enough. And we want to have a safe spot for that water to overflow that's not back towards the inlet and back towards your house. So we'll be talking about that, but generally we need your rain garden to be uphill slightly from an area where you can send runoff. We'll also talk about ways you can manipulate the topography around your rain garden to create that outlet. And you need to put your, your rain garden in a location that, that is clear of underground utilities or tree roots. So a rain garden, as you saw in the cross section, is a pretty deep uh, undertaking. We have to dig quite deep to build a rain garden. So we don't wanna be putting that um, underneath a mature tree where you'll be damaging the root system. Um, trees are incredible stormwater management tools. So we would never condone you know, damaging tree roots for the sake of uh, building a rain garden. And similarly, we don't want to encourage anyone to be digging over utilities or anything like that. So in order to determine that you're not digging over utilities, um, we encourage you, in fact, require you when you're working with us to contact Ontario One Call. It's a pretty straightforward process online. And um, you can see the website here or the phone number. Um, you have to provide your address and they give you an aerial and you can trace on there um, where you think you might put your rain garden. And it takes about maybe two weeks at the most. Um, you get uh, feedback from all the utilities in the area about where they're utilities are located on your property. And you can assure yourself that um, there's nothing under the spot where you're building a rain garden. So after you've assessed your property and um, picked out a general idea of a location based on the criteria I just described, we can uh, drill down on that location. Not literally, but confirm your location and get more specific. Um, so I picked a spot in the front corner of my uh, property. The downspout here is really flat, so it's coming down at like a very low angle, um, which gets weighed down in the snow and actually ends up making the downspout fall off, it turns out. Um, but it dumps all that runoff in this like dark compacted area on the side of our house, which gets pretty muddy. It's making, it makes it difficult for grass to grow there and it basically flows through there onto the neighbor's property, which is never uh, something you want to do. It's technically, we should all be keeping our own runoff on our own property. So um, I picked this side of my house, this front corner downspout, um, and I want to create, I want to turn the downspout, send it to my front yard, and that way I can have this front yard makeover I've been dreaming up a bit. So in addition to all the ecological fact, reasons to build a rain garden, which I've mentioned, another great reason if you're a gardener is you're creating a new type of ecosystem which doesn't exist on your property already. So uh, that's the other reason I want to do this. Um, uh, I won't be preventing too much runoff from going into the storm sewer because it's going onto my neighbor's yard currently. Um, and I'll reiterate that we just moved here, so I didn't design this setup. Uh, but we're going to turn that, send it to the front yard, and allow me now to have a new garden with new plants that wouldn't otherwise survive in my yard. So to begin with, to make my location work, we installed a rain barrel in this location. Um, and I'm, I've redirected the overflow from my rain barrel to go through this little evergreen uh, hedge here and pop out into the yard. I don't have that showing quite yet, but that'll be in the after pictures I, I circulate. 
So for your rain garden to work in the location of your choice, you may need to rejig the downspouts a bit. Uh, you may want to consider installing a rain barrel in addition to your rain garden, um, because then you'll have a nice source of water, which will help you maintain your rain garden in its first few years when it needs a little help. So step three, we're going to size the garden and lay it out. So now that we've picked the general location, we need to determine the surface area of our garden and start to lay out its shape. So now is a good time to start thinking about your garden in plan view or from above and consider sketching it out on a piece of graph paper or a printout of an aerial, ideally to scale. So graph paper is really helpful to create a scale, design one grid to be a meter or a foot or whatever makes sense for your yard draw on the dimensions of your house to scale so that you, when you start drawing out your garden, it all makes sense and works together and will be more realistic when you put it out in the actual yard. So the first thing you need to determine is the general size of your garden. Um, and we assume you're gonna follow the cross section that I showed earlier, which is a good 60 centimeter depth um, of digging, a, a 60 centimeter layer of sandy soil. Uh, you can estimate the surface area of your garden to be about a tenth of the size of the area draining to it. So we're going to figure out the size of the area draining to it and divide that by 10. And I'm going to do it with you here. So the total area of my house measured the length times the width is 116.5 square meters. So I'm pretty lucky mathematically here that I have four downspouts, one on each corner and the house from what I can tell pretty well equally sends water to each of the four downspouts. So I'm going to take that total area I determined and divide it by four. For you, if you have knowledge of your roof line and you know one downspout's draining 50% of your house, but you have three downspouts, you can adjust the math accordingly. Or if you know one of your downspouts is draining like a tiny little porch or something, you don't have to do it the same way I've done, but you want to figure out the total area of your roof that's draining into the downspout where you're building your rain garden. And so for me, that's 29.13 square meters. And so, as I mentioned before, we want the surface area of our rain garden to be about the tenth of a tenth of that size. So for me, that's 2.913 square meters. So that doesn't seem that massive, um, but that's what it looks like in my yard. So here's where I encourage you to get out some random stuff like I did for my garage, hoses, pool noodles, shovels, where I have um, laid out about an approximately three square meter rain garden with my hose. A hose works great to show curves and things, um, if that's kind of your style. I've used a shovel and a hockey stick for my inlet and outlet. And then I've laid out the pool noodles and the weird boot mat thing uh, there to show where I wanted to build up the earth a little to ensure that the water flows into my rain garden and out of the outlet and not over the sides of the rain garden. So when I'm digging out my rain garden, I'm going to be putting my pile of dirt in those locations on the where the pool noodles and the black rectangle are. So if you haven't jumped to graph paper yet, now is definitely a good time to jump to graph paper or your aerial photo if you can figure out how to scale that on your computer before you print it out. Um, and now you can start drawing the major components of your garden. So I'm gonna create a big garden on the left side of my sidewalk. I'm kind of, there's a bed on the right side. I'm sort of continuing that line, which is the light green line. I'm gonna continue that over and make a giant new landscape bed that'll be symmetrical for the front of my house. A portion of that garden, the brighter green, or I'm not sure, blue or green, I guess, is the rain garden cell. You can see the hashed red line is three meters set, um, offset from my house. So I put my rain garden cell starting at that dashed line and then started to draw my shape as four square meters. I decided I would just wanted my rain garden to be bigger than the three square meters that I calculated. So I'm gonna make it bigger. I might not make it quite as deep, but the total overall volume that I'm creating here will be similar to the three square meter plus 60 centimeter depth that we talked about earlier. So only a portion of this space will be rain garden, but uh, I wanna consider it as a one whole cohesive garden bed. So when it's all done and someone looks from the street, they might not even know it's a rain garden, which is fine. It'll just be a big, beautiful garden, hopefully. 
So now that you have the basic components of your garden located and drawn out, uh, you can start to consider some of the aesthetic features, um, planting design, inlets, and outlets. So we'll look at inlets first. This is both, both aesthetic and functional. Um, and it, I guess it depends on how you do it, if it's overly aesthetically pleasing. So for an inlet, you can do overland or underground. Overland flow, which is what's on the right side, was just letting water flow out of your downspout and creating a channel that's above ground that allows water to flow through it towards your rain garden. So this one's done with kind of some stepping stones, obviously like artificial stones. The picture, one of the pictures I showed earlier had a river rock channel. Water was exiting the downspout, flowing down that river rock channel and then into the rain garden. And I'll show a few more pictures throughout the presentation with different styles of inlets and um, you can see for yourself what you like. If you have a walkway or kids or a patio somewhere and you don't want a downspout exposed and you don't want water running down your patio, for example, and have, it might have the potential to freeze, um, you might want to consider an underground inlet. So the images on the left are both obviously underground or below grade. So the one on the far left, you can see it's a little bit blurry. The downspout on the porch column empties out at the corner of the porch. Water flows out of it into um, a drain that we put there, like a catch basin with a grate, a grate on top so that leaves and critters don't go down there. And then that water flows down a smooth walled PVC pipe. And then we built a sidewalk on top of it with pavers. And so the water exits the pipe and then a rain garden was constructed there at the base of the pipe. Uh, similarly, the one in the middle, very similar situation, the water flows out of the downspout into a catch basin, a small catch basin covered with a grate, um, and then PVC pipes carry it under the deck, and on, beyond the deck in the yard, it, it, uh, the pipe uh, outlets into a rain garden. So you can get pretty creative um, with getting water from point A to point B, as long as it's always sloped downwards to your rain garden. And we see every year examples of people who have beautiful new patios built, but didn't think about runoff or downspouts prior to the patio construction. And they end up having like a big long corded pipe stretched over their beautiful new patio. So if you're thinking of doing hardscaping or outdoor living spaces this year, I strongly encourage you to think about where the runoff is coming off your house, how the downspouts are working and figure out a way to deal with that prior to building your design or incorporate that into your design so that you're dealing with the water and it's not creating a freezing hazard or an unsightly uh, corrugated pipe across your patio. Um, here's another example of someone who did an underground outlet, a little bit messy on the left, but they attached uh, a pipe to the end of their downspout and stretched it out. Um, and they also attached the white pipe, which is for the overflow of their rain barrel. And then the picture on the right side is the rain garden built above all that. So she ended up incorporating a little walking path and then a big berm that leads down to a, a dish rain garden in there. So you'd have really no idea that all that stuff's going on underneath, um, but the pipes are exposed down in the rain garden and the water, the rain garden fills up in the rain and yet no one has to step over pipes or anything, which is what you want. Um, here's another example of someone's uh, rain garden. Again, they also did the stretched out pipe from the bottom of the downspout, filled up the channel or backfilled the channel with river rock. You can see how deep their rain garden basin was uh, at full depth, and then backfilled it with the sandy soil that I've mentioned and planted it. So when you look at the picture on the right, you would have no idea that that basin ever existed or that there was a pipe running uh, down into that little rain garden cell, it's completely incorporated into her landscape there. And so back to my design, I have added an inlet. So circled in red, I'm going to do a river rock channel there, similar to one of the pictures I showed at the beginning. So I'm just going to create a little swale, like literally that deep, uh, line it with landscape fabric and backfill it with a variety of different sized stones. The stones will help slow the water down so that when it does reach my rain garden, it's not going to wash out all my wood chips or damage any plants because it's of its velocity. So I might incorporate a flagstone or something on top of it so you could easily step over that, but I'm not sure quite yet. 
So outlets are a little bit easier. There's not as many underground sneaky options. It's pretty much always just a notch at the end of the lower side of your rain garden. So here are two examples. Um, it's a little bit hard to see in a built work because of, you know, if someone's holding the camera, it's hard to see the real topography, but the outlet is lower than the inlet. So when the rain garden gets full, it flows out the outlet. Um, but the then there's berms around it, which prevent the water from flowing out those sides. So when you're digging out your rain garden, you're really using the soil you're extracting from the ground to sculpt kind of a lip around your rain garden other than for the inlet and the outlet so that you can control the flow of water into it and out of your rain garden. Here you can see an example. This is just a quick kind of sketch, uh, obviously, of someone digging out a rain garden and berming up the sides. So you can see in between the berms that like towards us would be the outlet and then towards the house is where the inlet was. And that's the garden. And the next step where you can see the inlet and the outlet are lined with landscape fabric covered in river rock. Um, and then the rest of the garden went from there. So you can see also that really lovely sandy compost mix that was uh, filled into the hole that was dug for the rain garden. And so here's my design again with the outlet. So pretty basic when you're just drawing it on a piece of paper, but um, it's good to start thinking about where those are going to be so that you can then plan where your your berms and low berms are going to be um, and start kind of considering that when you're thinking of plants and things. So now that we have the above ground layout elements of our rain garden um, determined, we need to start dealing with the vertical cross section of the garden uh, or the below ground portion. So we need to plan our soil amendments. So as I've mentioned, the rain garden is filled with a 60 centimeter uh, layer of sandy compost soil. Uh, sand obviously is extremely quick draining, um, well draining and compost gives your plants the nutrients they need to function as well. So in order to determine <clears throat> how much of your soil you need to amend, um, we need to figure out what kind of soil you have and how well your site drains. And those are kind of two different questions. Um, we need to figure out if your soil, your native soil, sand, loam, or clay, of course, but we also kind of need to figure out if your soil drains well. So if you live on a sandy soil that happens to be really low and close to the uh, water table, it may not drain well, even if you have a good sandy soil. Um, so it's important to know uh, or to check that out by doing an infiltration test or in a ribbon test as shown in the picture above, I'll show you, help you figure out what kind of soil you have. So once you figured out kind of the general location of your rain garden, we recommend you do at least the infiltration test and maybe both of these tests to figure out what kind of soil you have and how well draining your site is. Um, if you Google infiltration test or soil ribbon test, you can get lots of videos or tutorials on how to do that and how to determine if you have a well draining site and if you have sand, loam or clay. So for my yard, luckily I'm sitting on basically it's complete sand. I guess it's silt. There's some brown material in there, but it's really well draining. If I got a, I got a hand fistful of it wet, like the picture in the, the top here, and tried to make a ribbon with it, and it made a basically zero length ribbon, uh, just falls right out of your hand. So it's really well drained or really sandy. And then I did an infiltration test and it drained, I forget the exact depth, but uh, you know, 20 centimeters over the course of uh, a couple of hours. So it drained really quickly, which is good. Uh, so like I said, rain garden soil is 60% sand and 40% compost. If you do the soil test and the infiltration test I mentioned and determine that you're on clay, and I think I've seen a couple, at least one question about clay come up. That's not the end of the world. It just means that you need to completely excavate the clay out and import all new soil, sand and compost. So your budget for your project will be higher and you'll have a excess amount of clay to dispose of or to incorporate in your berms. So I saw another question pop up about burn, how big are your berms? Well, if you had a clay garden, you had to dig out a whole whack of clay, you could have bigger berms. <laughs> for me, since I have sand, I'm just, my berms are gonna be quite small. Um, 
I'm going to just build up the land slightly around my rain garden and use a level to make sure that everything's flowing exactly in and out of the rain garden that I want the way I want it to. Um, so for me, because I have mostly sand, I'm just going to be purchasing some compost, some of which I'm getting from my composter in the backyard. So hopefully most of it will be free and I'm just going to eyeball it to get, you know, a little more than half sand and a little less than half more rich organic material. So it doesn't need to be an exact science, but um, to just, yeah, try to ballpark it. If you're buying, if you have clay and you have to purchase these materials, it's really easy to get the exact uh, mix you need by purchasing it individually and mixing it, as you can see this uh, volunteer doing on the left, um, or at some landscape supply companies will mix it for you and deliver it uh, pre-mixed, which is kind of nice. So the last thing we're gonna do is planting design. So that's the fun part in my opinion. Um, rain garden plants are unique in that they can tolerate complete infiltration during a rain event. So they can tolerate standing water for several hours, but then they can also to tolerate um, complete drought. So your rain garden will be wet obviously in a rain event, but then during in between rain events, it's like a drought situation. So the plants have to be able to tolerate both inundation and uh, drought. And um, many native plants are particularly well suited for these types of conditions. So when you're thinking about your planting design and what you wanna put in your rain garden, there's kind of two tiers of things to think about. The first tier uh, you wanna consider are the soil conditions, light conditions, and the mature size of your plant. So we've amended the soil. So we pretty much know the soil conditions. It's gonna be a sandy compost soil. So that's something to know. Light conditions depends on your location. And so I encourage you to look at your yard throughout the day um, to get an idea if it's more or less than six hours of light, of, sun, of direct sunlight. And then the next kind of, that would be full sun or part sun if it's less than six. If it's less than three, it's shade. Um, there's plants that will work in any of those light conditions, but it's important to know so you get the right plants and they can be uh, healthy. Uh, the last thing is really important, which is mature size. So native plants in particular come in really small packages, uh, little plant plugs that in just a year or two take up a pretty big space depending on, on which plant. So just something to keep in mind when you're picking your plants to Google or look up in a plant book, the mature size of your plant. And when you're drawing them on your garden design, which I'll show you in a minute, to use the mature size. So you're getting just the right amount of plants and you're not going to have to spend the next two or three years moving and dividing things, which you might do anyway. I do that too, but something to be aware of. Uh, to help you along with your planting design, I've got uh, I've created a rain garden plant list, which you can get from our Healthy Yards website um, via reapgreen.ca. So this is just one page from the plant list, but basically I've put dozens of perennials, grasses, and shrubs that are suitable for our, our area in Ontario for a rain garden. Um, I definitely encourage you to look at this when you're picking out plants for your rain garden. Um, obviously there's a picture of each plant. It's common in Latin name, it's mature height, um, and then it's light conditions, the pre uh, preferences are there with the sun symbols. And then each one's labeled with an S, a B, or an S and a B. And that stands for side slope or base. So some of the plants are suitable for the flat bottom part of your rain garden, the base, where it will be really wet for the longest. And some are pretty good with that, but wanna be on the side where they're not completely in, um, inundated in, in standing water for as often. So it's important to look at that on the plant list and make sure you're getting the bee specialists on the bottom of your rain garden because those will be the most stressed if they're not happy in that location. There's a variety of native, native shrubs that will work well in a rain garden. And I definitely encourage you to consider using a woody plant of some kind in your rain garden um, because of their winter interest and their habitat value all year round for lots of different types of animals, not just pollinators. Um, however, native plants, native shrubs, I mean, uh, can get huge. And many of us live in urban residential areas uh, where we just don't want an eight foot by eight foot dogwood. Um, and that's okay. So we uh, openly condone the use of nativars, um, which are sort of 
you know, cult one cultivation away from native. Uh, so there's lots of examples of dwarf shrubs that, that we call cult uh, native R. So for instance, red osier dogwood, you can get a, a dwarf uh, native R version of that. Same with nine bark, same with winterberry. There's lots of options, same with viburnum. Uh, so consider that if you feel like the ones that, that are suggested in the plant list are just too big. These are all pure natives, but you certainly could consider uh, something from a garden center that's got the first word of the Latin name in it, but maybe the second word is a little bit different and it's a smaller stature. From observational experience and from colleagues experiences as well, these plants are still um, really well visited by pollinators. So of course natives are the best for our native um, fauna, but this is still a really good option if you can't accommodate a big plant. So for my garden, I'm gonna start with that structure um, and I'm going to put three dwarf red twig dogwoods in the locations you can see here. And I've also put a layer of mulch over the entire thing. So I recommend that you put a good 10 inch, no, sorry, 10 centimeter <laughs> layer of mulch on your rain garden when you're finished uh, building it. Um, just to do to suppress weed growth, to protect the plants from drought, um, and to continue providing nutrients to the plants over the, the course of the year. So I've got the three dwarf red twig dogwoods in my design here, and you can see I picked these because I want some sort of structure that anchors the garden, not just all perennials. Um, and I love the winter interest of the dogwood, and I think it'll look really good contrasting with the um, dark green conifers that are behind it. And it will also have beautiful white flowers in the spring. So the next tier of consideration after those first three we talked about uh, includes seasonal interest, texture, bloom color, and leaf color. So for seasonal interest, we want to plan a garden that's got something interesting going on all four seasons. So spring and summer and fall, that's pretty easy to get some kind of bloom going, but you kind of need to keep a list of what you're thinking about using, keep a list of when it blooms and make sure you've got something blooming all through the summer or all through the year. For winter, we look to plants that have interesting twigs or grasses that have a winter form that you don't prune back um, or a conifer. So I shared the picture here to show a yellow twig dogwood uh, with a, U, a row of U's behind it. So to me, this is a good example of uh, this garden I took a photo of this garden um, not too long ago, but before any of the perennials came up, it's full of shade tolerant perennials, but right now it still looks really good because we put some structural plants with winter interest in the garden. So it has a nice sturdy presence, even when the beautiful perennials are still dormant. Uh, the next pictures I uh, have here kind of illustrating the importance of texture. So when I say texture, I'm kind of referring to the size and scale of the leaves and flowers of a plant. So I like to alternate textures. So I like to put a clump of something with big fat broad leaves next to something with little tiny leaves or flowers. Um, so I like to alternate the textures. You can see in the photos here, um, I took these on a hike this spring and I thought that, I don't know, to me nature is the best muse for planting design and color palettes. Uh, but all of this was naturally occurring. So on the left, you have big, broad mayapple leaves mixed with wood aster. So a really fine textured leaf with a very fine textured flower. Um, on the right, similarly, we have a big, broad trillium next to some fine textured ground cover, including some ferns. So if you picture these two pictures, or picture these plants, if we had the mayapple and the trillium together, that would be okay, but you wouldn't really appreciate each of them for their beauty. Similarly, if we had the ferns and the aster together, they might blend together a bit. But when you pair this fine texture with the broad texture next to each other in a grouping, um, it really allows you to appreciate both types of plants. Um, and it reads well for your brain and uh, provides some interest to the eye when you're walking through the garden or walking by the garden. So to continue with my uh, nature is my muse theme, on the left side, um, I've got uh, a few, another natural pairing that I just love and find inspiring for my gardens. And this is a uh, goldenrod with aster in a natural area, Huron natural area for anyone who's from the area and familiar. 
So these are two fall bloomers that are just gorgeous together. Um, it's all over town. So it's really lovely to go on a bike ride or a walk or whatever in September and October to see these blooming. Um, and I would like to put a plug in for late season bloomers. So we give a lot of attention to milkweed and its important role for monarchs, but September, October is this challenging time for lots of pollinators, including monarchs who are migrating. So cons consider putting a flower like one of these in your garden that blooms late into the fall because it's an important um, nectar source for our pollinators that migrate during that time of the year. The garden on the right um, it's a good example of varying texture. Again, as I mentioned earlier, so we've got ferns adjacent to hosta where you can but really like appreciate each one for its form. Um, it's also a good example of how you can mix different shades of green. So kind of the blue green leaves of the hosta, the bright green leaves of the fern um, and the darker leaves, glossy leaves of the uh, dogwood. And then at the very back, there's like burgundy leaves of a black lace elderberry. So mixing in different kind of leaf colors. Um, and again, I'm a fan of groupings of each of those things. So you can really take it in and appreciate it uh, even with just a quick glance. And similarly, there's coordinated blooms in this garden. So there's a lilac tree that's blooming and allium that's blooming, so different shades of purple, but they go well together. Um, there's blue flag iris um, and the elderberry, which blooms a nice kind of pinkish white. So all of those things go together well, but there are different colors. So something to keep in mind when you're planning your, which blooms you're going to have in your garden. Oh, there we go. The last garden inspiration I'll share with you tonight is from my uh, parents' garden in North Carolina. So they bought a property that was a daylily farm. Um, bought, or they had hundreds of varieties of daylilies and sold them to people. I'm not sure who bought them, but <laughs> um, so they completely did their landscape. And um, I inserted myself on that project and we did this lovely border where we paid homage to the daylily heritage of the farm, but it incorporated this landscape borders with daylilies and we added in native. So there's orange butterfly weed and a rhythm of little blue stem grasses that continue along the whole length of the border. Um, and I include this example, A, because I think it's beautiful, uh, B, because while we, I keep talking about the benefits of native plants, uh, I think it's really important to love the plants in your garden. So if there's any plants that you just love, it's really, I think, wonderful. And I encourage you to incorporate those into your rain garden as well. So maybe not in the rain garden, but all around it, the berms, the broader areas around your garden is a great spot to incorporate plants that you just love. And sometimes they can provide a really good structure, formality to your garden that sometimes native plants uh, struggle to do. So there's definitely room for non-natives um, as long as they're not invasive in your garden. So for my rain garden that I've been designing here uh, with you tonight, I'm going to first look at my basin plants. Um, and I'm going to use the principles I've talked about for my whole planting design. So I've got my red twig dogwood structure and foundation already laid out. Um, and then I'm going to mix in some Joe pie weed, blue flag iris, and Leatris spicata, a dense blazing star, into the basin plants for my rain garden. Because I have the nice structure of the dogwood and the conifer hedge, I feel like I can really have fun with beautiful blooming things and not worry too much about winter interest uh, inside my rain garden. Around the sides of my garden where it's a little less um, stressful, like not as much infiltration, um, I'm going to incorporate a variety of other natives and a couple of non-natives. Um, so I'm going to put a row of ferns uh, along my inlet because that area is a little bit shadier and I just love ferns. Um, and I'm gonna also include three or two different clumps of little blue stem or three groupings of little blue stem here. I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but I'm circling it anyway. I'm gonna put a mix of butterfly weed and aster over here by the right-hand side of my garden. And I'm going to li finish lining out my garden with some ladies mantle so I can get some big broad leaf texture in there to balance out the blue stem and the, a little bit of the messiness of the flowers I've put into my rain garden. And on the edges where the sidewalk is, I'm going to incorporate peonies because I love them. And so I encourage you to do something like that too. 
So that's the end of my rain garden planting design. I'm going to put it back up just for another second because I do like looking at all those plants. But uh, so we're done designing our rain garden. We have a solid planting design and a good location that meets all of our criteria. So we're ready to build. However, before you build, I encourage you to make a plan to maintain your rain garden. So native plants, if you're using a lot of those in your rain garden, are typically lower maintenance than other types of plants. However, they're still babies when you plant them. So for the first two years or so of your rain garden, you do need to water it, um, especially during hot summer months when there's uh, not a lot of rain. So consider how, you're, how you'll do that before you get started on this project. Like I showed before, I incorporated a rain barrel into mine. Um, so I'll have water right there and I can uh, attach a soaker hose or um, use just use a watering can to keep my garden alive over the next summer or two. Uh, we also encourage you to replenish the mulch in your garden annually, or at least check that you're maintaining that approximately 10 centimeter layer of mulch to suppress weed growth. Um, you may need to divide perennials and thin them out over the years to um, promote their continued blooming, but it depends on the plant and you can easily look up each type of plant you're using to get advice on that. Um, and annually, at least once a year, usually in the fall, if not in the fall, definitely in the spring, you want to check to ensure that your inlet and your outlet are clear of any um, leaf litter, or sediments, sticks, whatever else is falling in your, your yard to make sure that the water is flowing properly into and out of your rain garden. You may want to do a more serious clean out every three to five years, where if you're doing the river rock te technique like I showed, where you're maybe removing the river rock cleaning out any sediment that is gathered there and then replacing it with back, not buying new. Uh, just to ma maintain that inlet and outlet, it's critically important. The rest of the garden should maintain itself if you're um, dealing with the plants properly, watering them, maintaining the mulch layer, and doing any divisions that are necessary after the plants have matured. So with that, we have 10, 15 minutes or so uh, for questions, which I've seen quite a few come through. So quickly before we do that, uh, thanks for joining me tonight. Um, if you are a resident of the city of Kitchener, please check out our website, reapgreen.ca slash rain dash smart to learn more about the Rain Smart Neighborhoods program I mentioned earlier. Thanks again for joining me and I'll throw it over to Sarah to help moderate some questions. Thanks, Becca. Yeah, I've got a couple questions here for you. Um, one of the ones actually that came up, um, is it, I'm curious to know, is it possible to have a rain garden closer to a structure without a foundation? So what would be your spacing requirements within that? Um, yeah, it can be less than the 10 feet or three meters that I recommended if there is no foundation. Uh, I still wouldn't do it right up against um, anything, um, any vertical, building um so but you could probably reduce that to like three to five feet or something i would think that's what i was gonna say but i thought i better save myself <laughs> yeah, <perfect. That's> <laughs> okay um actually i had a couple questions come in about um about slopes and wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that um so specifically here um yeah, so water flowing across the entire property and not just through the, the rain the rain spouts. Um, do, 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 when the grain of the property runs down. Yeah, would you be able to speak a little bit more to any recommendations that you would have when working with the slope? Uh -huh. So the one to five percent slope recommendation is just to say that if you live on a steeper property, um, and you start infiltrating, you know, hundreds of liters of water, um, it can really destabilize the slope and be, a, you know, dangerous, I guess, at that point, or a hassle if it's, um, the plants are sliding down the slope. So that's why we say that recommendation. Um, I would encourage that person, if their slope is gr great, significantly greater than one to 5%, to just consider naturalizing their landscape and not doing the dig and replacement of soil. Replacing a steep bank with sand, you can kind of picture what that would, how that would go. Um, so I'd just recommend a way, I would discourage the big 60 centimeter depth of soil, a sandy soil and encourage that person to naturalize their landscape using perennials like and shrubs like we discussed and um, 
That way they could broaden their search for plants to include other soil types, depending on what kind of soil they have. I just saw another one come in here on that note. They say their, their whole front yard is sloped down to the road, um, but the owners before had put in large river rocks across the whole front yard. Uh, can we use the resources we have for a rain garden? So I didn't quite catch the first part of that. Uh, so there, the whole the whole front yard is sloped down to the road, but I guess it was the the uh, front yard was amended with large river rock in the front yard. So I guess wondering if they can do anything with the river rock to amend the slope. Okay. So having a steady slope from your house to the road isn't it's good probably for your house. Um, you could I would so the rule of thumb is you don't, don't want to put a rain garden at the bottom of anything or in a problem area. So let's say, for example, someone has a poorly drained area that's always filling up with rain. You would want to put the rain garden upstream from that and so solve the problem before it gets to that area. So I kind of say the same thing in this case. You may, if you're considering a rain garden, um, you would want to do that like midway down so that it does overflow and keep going down slope towards the road. But hopefully your rain garden would be big enough to minimize the amount of overflow. You could certainly use river rock again, and you could certainly consider like a dry well, if you have a boatload of river rock um, and you're not into gardening, a, a dry well or infiltration gallery could be a good solution, low cost if you already have a lot of the rock. Um, or some sort of kind of like dry creek bed aesthetic, which you could Google that or Pinterest that and see some visual examples of what that could look like if you have a lot of rock available already. Um, on another topic, uh, another one that came in, uh, are, are there any concerns for below ground downspouts in the winter time? So like the examples I showed, meaning like if you're gonna down, dig below ground inlets, mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of below ground downspouts. There's whole neighborhoods here where all the downspouts go into the ground and are directly piped into the stormwater sewer. So if the pipes are pitched the right way, they can maintain flow and ice doesn't build up in them. We encourage, so you need to maintain at least a 2% slope and we recommend smooth walled hard pipes rather than like a corrugated pipe. So often what happens is people use corrugated pipe, I think, because it's easier to get and cheaper. And that it's very difficult to maintain a 2% slope underground. You can't see it with you have like a flimsy pipe that could get crushed. So we don't recommend you use those. However, lots of people seem to. I showed photos of them today because lots of people who I recommended not do that, do they do do it. <laughs> um, but I think that's when you get problems with ice because it's flat. It ends up, it winds up being flat underground where water sits and freezes. But if you keep your pipe smooth walled, hard and at a 2% slope, ice buildup doesn't really occur. Um, we also recommend, like I think I showed a couple, two examples that I was part of where the water falls out of the downspout and into a, um, catch basin with the grate rather than a continuous pipe that's buried. Um, and the reason we recommend that is just to give some separation. So if there is a buildup in the pipe, you're the first, you get to know about it because you can see in the grate or you could put snake something down in the grate and figure out what's going on. Similarly, you could go up the downspout or fix your downspout without having to unearth this entire complex of pipes, it's all connected. So we recommend you have a separation at that at some point, typically at the end of your downspout where water falls into the catch basin. And that gives you access to check out this stuff if you're not confident it's working. So those are my two long-winded points. <laughs> okay. Uh, another one here. Let me see. Ah, okay. This was um this was a question that came in as you were talking about the, the overall sizing. Uh, I'm not too sure on the answer. Can, can, you do, can you do the rain garden less deep and wider to avoid watering the rain garden? You can do your, your rain garden less deep and wider for sure to capture the same amount of storm water coming off your roof. And the size we recommended with that 60 centimeter layer of sandy soil plus the pond space at the top 
we, that's been designed to accommodate the majority of the storms we have here in Waterloo Region. Potentially, we'll need to update that over the next decade or so. Um, uh, you can make it wider and shallower, of course, and still accomplish the same thing, but you'd still need to water it no matter what, probably for the first two years if we're not getting sufficient rain because it will still drain really quickly no matter what size you make it. Um, and the plants will struggle without, ear, without water for the first two years. But after you get through those two years, you should be sailing and they're very hardy drought tolerant plants at that point. Um, another one here, actually, do you have, um, do you have any further points on um, what kind of sand is used in the composition? Yeah. Um, I'm kind of blanking on the type, like what you'd see as the hardware store, just fine. Um, you can use like playground sand from Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, I wouldn't use dust, um, but like smooth grain, medium grain sand from uh, a hardware store or landscape supply store uh, would be good. Um, I did have a couple of questions on mulch actually. Uh, first, why, why do you recommend hardwood mulch? So um, I'm not sure I said that, uh, which is fine. I recommend hardwood mulch. <laughs> I recommend shredded pine mulch mostly, which isn't hardwood. Um, the best mulch I recommend if you're from here is composted pine mulch. I like to buy it from Adams Landscape Supply. Uh, that is not an endorsement per se. But they happen to have it. Um, it's older, so it's got more organic material already in it. Um, it's shredded finely, so it doesn't float. You don't want to get freshly chipped wood chunks in there, which that's stuff you get for free. Usually if something's like just recently went through the chipper, first of all, it floats away and clogs up your outlet. Um, second of all, it's too fresh. It like sucks all the nutrients out of the ground while it's decomposing. Uh, so it's not good for your plants. Um, yeah. So I recommend composted pine mulch or any sort of finely shredded hardwood or, you know, cedar or pine mulch typically, but I saw someone else who said straw mulch. That's okay. I mean, any, any kind of mulch that you're comfortable with, it's not going to float would be my first recommendation. Cool. Um, I used nincompoop one time, one year, which is, I'm not even sure what that is. It's a mostly compost. Um, but I kind of, I like to use a mulch that has a little bit of nutrient value, which is why I say the composted pine mulch part. Uh, and then the, the follow-up to that was, um, is it is it beneficial to, do you need to continue amending the soil as the mulch breaks down? No. No. Yeah because you're going to disrupt the ecosystem and the plants so much. Um, and if your outlet's continuing to work, uh, it'll still continue to function really well into perpetuity. So I only have like 10 years of data, hard personal data on that. <laughs> um, but lots of people who, are, who have longer careers than me have also said that. <laughs> there was... Okay, there was another follow-up question that came in as we were discussing the last one. Um, it, in terms of the the, the maintenance period, um, why do you say the the, the two the two-year maintenance period is with the the root structures developing? Yep. Yeah, it takes two years or so for a native plant to really take hold and grow and become drought tolerant. So the annual maintenance is for the inlet and outlet and the two year watering maintenance is just to let your plants get established. And that's true for any plant. And I just have to add that because native people assume native plants are maintenance free or low maintenance and they are eventually, but just not at first, nothing really is when it's um, brand new in the ground. Okay. Um, another, actually the one other question here that, uh, that was, I saw it come in a couple times um, what do you, if, what would you recommend for, for overflow if a lawn or naturalized area is not available as an option? So I guess that's to say that the rain garden would be a butting up against sidewalk or something. Yeah, I think it was restrictions around property lines, I believe, because the, the over, the only option from there is to redirect the overflow down to, uh, storm sewers. Yeah, so I mean, 
technically you're not supposed to let any runoff off of your property. Obviously lots of people do that. Lots of people have downspouts dumping on their driveways and rushing down to the storm sewer. Um, you can't have a pipe inlet or like a uh, outlet onto a sidewalk, a municipal sidewalk that's against bylaw because it would uh, freeze and cause a hazard. Um, so in that case, I would consider plant heavily planting your outlet with the grasses or something like the kind of grasses that would be on the B list for our plants so, or no S so side slope grasses or something so that the, out, the water can escape um, but it's not like coming into, it's not an obvious uh, exit where it's going to be rushing out. So the plants would help slow it down and disperse it. So maybe make your outlet wider and fully planted with a side slope plant, like a grass or something that would get a really good coverage. And that's what I would do in that case. Um, there's just a couple, a couple new questions that have filtered in uh, since we, we started chatting here. Um, one in particular that came up, I would think that the location may not be ideal, um, but what, so Carol says here, what, what could I do about working around an old large black walnut tree close to my downspout at the back of my home? Its canopy, uh, its canopy comes over the roof. Right, whoa. Mm. Um, so there's lots of plants that can tolerate black walnut. I should do this, which I'll do. Um, maybe you can send me an email and remind me of your contact information, a person who asked the question, um, because there's lots of lists of plants that would work under a black walnut. And then just, I need to cross-reference that with rain garden plants and come up with a good list. Um, the main thing I, red flag I have from that question is if your rain garden is too close to that tree, because we don't want to, damage the root system of the tree. So if your rain garden is kind of outside of the canopy of the tree, then I would say you could, you should proceed. If it's too, under the canopy of the tree, then that's where the critical roots are for the tree. And you likely would just need to steer away from doing any sort of big excavation in that area. Uh, another one here, when, when you design the rain garden, can you use a weeping tile under the river rock? Um, under the river walk, rock, um, in the inlet or the outlet or all the way through. And I guess I'll answer that all of those. Uh, yes, <laughs> you, I, we wouldn't recommend a weeping tile in through the inlet, I guess, because it's too, might be too close to your house to start, uh, in, you know, sending water into the ground, infiltrating water. So it could possibly connect to a smooth walled pipe that's coming from your downspout further into your further away or be used at the bottom of your rain garden as like a under drain. So if you Google rain garden under drain, you'd see a lot of good diagrams that would probably give you a better visual of what it might look like. Often in municipal settings or for really big rain gardens where there's like no room for error because of the volume of runoff, like a parking lot, there's a layer of gravel under the rain garden with a weeping tile in it um, or a perforated pipe in it that would help gather any excess water that drains through your rain garden but um, and then carry it away that way. So again, like I said, Google um, rain garden under drain, and I imagine you'll find some helpful diagrams. I am going to take note of the rest of the comments that are left here uh, unanswered, uh, and we'll we'll try to get back to you directly via email. Um, but I think we will we'll, we'll wrap that up here. And thank you guys so much for 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 joining tonight. It was uh, great to connect with you all, and I hope that. Uh, you all learned learned a lot from from this presentation, and again, a big thanks to the the city of Kitchener for sponsoring this event, um, and a great big thank you to Becca as well. Thanks, everyone.